Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, to this seminar. My name is Cosmin Nada, and I'm an educational researcher and consultant. I am based at the University of Porto in Portugal. Uh, I know that we have uh, here some colleagues who do not belong to the working group uh, schools pathways to school success. Um, and therefore, I think it is important to briefly explain what we have been doing in the last uh, month. This working group is now engaged in a reflection that started in September last year on targeted support and more specifically on identifying groups at risk and providing adequate support. This is obviously not an easy uh, topic since it is challenging to strike uh, a balance between holistic education where we cater for the needs of all and targeted support for the more uh, vulnerable learners. During our first uh, meeting in September last uh, year, we started uh, exploring strategies for identifying and addressing the needs of learners, particularly vulnerable to exclusion, and we learned more about the latest Eurydice report, Diversity and Inclusion. In our October meeting, we learned more about the state of play of different systems when it comes to flexibility to meet all learners' needs from a comprehensive mapping conducted by ASNIA and we discussed the challenges to effective targeted support. In our January meeting, we progressed towards discussing the roles that different actors, ministries, municipalities, communities can play in ensuring inclusive processes and how these efforts can be reinforced through collaboration and complementarity. This was uh, especially important in the context of the just released at the time a PISA results showing a continuous trend of decreasing results and the need for action. Very often during our discussions, we were reminded that practical implementation of certain policies and measures is challenging and that schools cannot and should not bear the responsibility of inclusion and targeted support alone. There is much that can be achieved from close, collaborate, uh, close collaboration with other bodies and institutions. And it is precisely in this framework that the current seminar on the role of municipality emerges to explore the critical role that municipalities play in enhancing uh, inclusive education. With the support of four insightful examples, we will see how local governance structures can support, implement and drive inclusivity in educational settings. As Annalisa mentioned uh, at the very beginning, the seminar will have two parts, a first one dedicated to the presentations of our invited speakers, followed by a questions and answers uh, session. And the second part, which is dedicated to the members of the working group schools pathways, where we will uh, have a self reflection moment to help us progress with the discussions we had so far and reflect upon the insightful input that uh, we will receive today. Of course, our uh, guest speakers are invited to stay for, for this moment and observe this self-reflection moment and its results and eventually contribute to it, while the, the other colleagues that are not part of the working group schools are, are free to leave the seminar when we arrive to this, uh, to this second uh, part. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce and, uh, and give the floor to, to our first um, speaker, who is Paolo Ciambellini. And uh, Paolo Ciambellini is a Social Affairs Forum Coordinator and Policy Advisor at EuroCities, the leading uh, network of European cities. Prior to his role, Paolo has worked for various key organizations and consultative bodies representing local and regional authorities, including the Committee of the Regions and the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. Paolo, the, the floor is yours and you have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. Yes, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Cosmin, for the excessive introduction. I will First of all, share my slides. Just give me a second. Okay. And normally you should also be able to see my PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Uh, yes. So thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to intervene the, um, 
I found the interest that you have expressed to the work of our organization, especially of the rural municipalities, uh, when it comes to designing inclusive educational settings. And uh, I hope that this cooperation can also uh, co continue in the future, of course, because, uh, we have as an organization a long track and a long record of working on inclusive education. I'm also happy to have this timely discussion a week after our working group meeting hosted by the city of Helsinki precisely on the topic on how cities can prevent educational segregation and inclusion. So I'm also really happy that our colleague from colleagues from Helsinki can present after after me. Uh, really. Uh, Yes, let's see. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, a couple of words on our organization, EuroCities. EuroCities is the uh, leading and largest network of uh, major European cities. We connect more than 200 cities across Europe and we represent overall 150 million people. And as I said, we have a specific working group working on education. And of course, inclusion is one of our, uh, one of our key topics that we've been addressed in the past, in the, in the, in the past years. But, uh, um, Going further with the presentation, really what I would like to do in, uh, in these 10 minutes, and I promise to be, of course, on time, uh, is really to focus on which instrument and strategies municipalities uh, have and can deploy to really foster and design inclusive educational settings. And uh, here, first of all, I would like to focus, focus uh, on, the, on the urban dimension of, uh, uh, on the urban dimension of uh, uh, inclusive education. So, first of all, why talking about cities when it comes to inclusive education? And uh, during our discussion with the European Commission, but also with different actors, it was really interesting to hear um, uh, how the role of cities is even more acknowledged, and, uh, uh, but perhaps not yet the full extent of the role of cities is known, uh, is known especially at the national level. But uh, first of all, we, uh, we see an increase in urban population. There are projections uh, expecting the urban population to be uh, represent 70% of all inhabitants in Europe, and this projection is an, an increase to, to grow. So, of course, this already sets a broader picture of a growing demand for essential public services and local services, including education. So, uh, um, and uh, also in urban areas, we see a uh, concentration of the social, of the major socio-economic challenges the member states uh, are facing, uh, which are concentrated again in our in our cities. So. Um, uh, what do we mean uh, for educational inclusion or exclusion for cities? Here, again, I would like to stress the spatial dimension of uh, educational inclusion and how can cities really uh, um, prevent uh, um, uh, exclusion from happening? Uh, because, of course, uh, um, uh, this uh, relates especially to the competence and to the role that cities have when it comes to, for instance, integrated urban planning and to the knowledge they have on how to uh, prevent the concentration of specific socioeconomic um, groups in, uh, to be concentrated in specific areas and therefore affecting the access to quality, uh, to quality education. So again, really the spatial element is something that is uh, particularly important and relevant for uh, when designing inclusive edu education, uh, educational settings. And uh, again, the special ed uh, element can also uh, be visible and tangible when it comes to the physical barriers that some students, especially coming from low income background, from migrant background, uh, um, when accessing education, which may be, for instance, a distance from the best schools uh, to uh, which are in most cases located in, the, in our city centers. So there are physical barriers that uh, students face uh, when accessing uh, education. Uh, considering these overlapping trends, uh, meaning the growing urban population on the one hand, uh, and especially the youth population in cities, and especially in the youth, and particularly in the youth population, we have a lot of vulnerable groups uh, overrepresented, such as again people with migrant background, uh, uh, newcomers. It is not surprising to observe, therefore, a greater involvement of cities in education policies, and this is a growing trend in Europe, but also beyond. And of course, as a general uh, uh, consideration, this is a positive uh, trend that we need to support, of course, because uh, transferring uh, um, autonomy to local authorities when it comes to education policies may really bridge the gaps that uh, in many cases there is between education ministries, for instance, and families, and really foster a co-creation approach uh, when it comes to education policies. Uh, then I would like to show you uh, quickly um, a figure second because it takes some time to change slide okay perfect uh, this is a bit uh, 
outdated meaning that is from 2017, but still most of the fundings, uh, it was an OECD publication uh, uh, testing decentralization in education, but they're still extremely relevant uh, and gives a bit of a broad picture of the state of play of decentralization, specifically focusing here on lower secondary education. And two points that I wanted to raise by looking at the, at the table. Uh, first of all, we can observe, of course, to a varying degree across member states, uh, a level, a high level of school autonomy across several member states. And this is, of course, something positive that should be welcome. But from the information and uh, that we have gathered across the years in Eurocities, uh, in our organization, uh, at the same time, a high degree of school autonomy should also be complemented by strong and effective coordination mechanism with municipal authorities. Uh, this is because for one major region, reason, especially we come when we, when we uh, talk about inclusive education, uh, because schools in some cases might lack incentives of financial, but also of a reputational nature uh, to address wider inequality issues and intervene concretely to, for instance, admit vulnerable or mar marginalized groups uh, in, in, in schools. So of course here, the role of municipal authorities to um, to uh, help, uh, but also monitor what schools are doing is also uh, extremely uh, important. And still, uh, uh, which is, uh, and still, also what we see is a significant degree uh, of centralization when it comes to personal management decision. And so I will elaborate a bit further uh, in a moment. Uh, this is also might limit cities abilities also to attract uh, qualified staff in uh, areas, uh, low income areas, uh, and to really foster the educational outcomes of uh, at risk students. So this is something that we would like to see changing in the near future. So giving to municipalities more role and more autonomy when it comes to Per, um, personal management decision and also investing in more human resources uh, to address also the st uh, staff, uh, the teacher staff shortages that many cities are confronted with in Europe uh, at the present time. So going, moving forward, uh, then how can cities uh, concretely design inclusive educational settings? What are the main uh, instruments the cities have uh, at their disposal? First of all, um, Demographic analysis is a really crucial, important element to prevent educational segregation. Uh, the knowledge of cities administration is crucial uh, because, of course, the uh, insofar as inclusive education policies have the ultimate aim of avoiding precisely the concentration of vulnerable and at risk students in particular areas. And to do this, you need also, of course, to have a quantitative, but also qualitative data on the cities of population to have an inclusive uh, uh, planning of the school supply. For instance, uh, it, it was the case, for instance, for the city of Barcelona, but for many other city administration, um, since they have competence, of course, on the physical environment by urban planning, integrated urban planning, um, they, for instance, uh, can adjust this process to foster inclusive educational settings, opening new schools uh, uh, in those neighborhoods with insufficient supplies, um, or, for instance, merging or closing schools where might, there might be also an oversupply in a given territory. So, again, the spatial dimension really important when it comes to educational inclusion. Then uh, definition and design of catchment areas. Uh, catchment areas are again um, uh, another key instrument that uh, uh, local authorities have at their disposal uh, in, uh, in, in fostering inclusive educational settings. Usually the key criterion is proximity, meaning that uh, there is uh, generally a right to students to be enrolled in the school that is closer to uh, their, uh, where, they, where they live, but this, of course, uh, if taken to the full extent and without, be, uh, without uh, um, uh, complementing the proximity element with other, uh, uh, with other, uh, with other uh, principles, which may be income consideration, other kind of consideration, might uh, concretely lead to the concentration of at three students uh, in specific uh, schools uh, and uh, uh, fuel uh, educational segregation. Then, third, admission policies. Admission policies are incredibly important. Again, as I was saying before, admission policies are also in many cases, uh, in many cases uh, um, part of the competence of schools. And again, then the risk is that some schools might have, might lack uh, incentives or monitoring to, uh, uh, to, um, to include also vulnerable students. And in many cases, this might because of reputational issues uh, and also because in many cases, generally a lack of adequate also um, human resources to uh, provide services for learners with special needs, for instance. Uh, and, uh, and again, admission, admission policies are perhaps 
one of the most important because really they can intervene directly on the concentration and the distribution of students uh, to, uh, to achieve a greater balance in, when it comes to school compositions. There are different approaches across Europe. Overall, we can see that the most co common principle is to complement the right of students to attend their local school uh, and, uh, and also to integrate this approach with specific pol policies aiming at achieving greater balance in schools, integrated with income considerations, but also there are some also algorithmic management uh, instruments that have been developed. For instance, the city of Barcelona has been particularly leading uh, on this, which, uh, so again, the idea is really to make sure that cities can complement the proximity with the socioeconomic criteria, which is something that really prevents educational segregation. And also other policies might concretely entail reserving some places uh, in each school for students at risk or set a maximum number of these students to meet the role in each school. So the policies might vary, but again, distribution and avoiding concentration is, uh, uh, is, the, uh, is the key, again, in this context. Then, uh, uh, here I would like to perhaps devote a couple of um, words on concrete strategies. So we have reviewed the instruments, but now perhaps how, which are some strategies, which are, of course, are non-exhaustive non uh, in this case to achieve educational inclusion. One example that I mentioned here, the city of Cluj, because coming from a country which has a relatively young or more recent history of uh, decentralization in education, might be even more uh, interesting to hear from, the so-called cluster approach. And here uh, for cluster, and it's a really an important approach that also relates to applying social innovation and really an ecosystem approach to education, which is something that cities are trying to do, but of course it's not relevant because even cities administration sometimes uh, tend to work in silos, so there is not really cooperation across departments, but also uh, schools here, they really can play a fundamental role in bridging the gaps and the links between schools on the one hand and overall local ecosystem in terms of, for instance, when we refer to academia, to school, to the, uh, to the wider social economy enterprises, for instance, and really the leverage the full extent and the full potential of those partnerships also to foster greater, edu uh, better educational outcomes for, um, for, uh, for students and really here again. Uh, the role uh, of municipalities is a bridge between schools because much can be achieved in schools, but of course it's also important that we really uh, follow the, uh, the, uh, the words of it takes a village to raise a, a student, a child, and it takes a whole ecosystem to foster greater educational inclusion. And here cities can play a fundamental role. Another set of strategies that I will, would like to mention, because here they relate in a way to the regulatory powers of cities and how they can correct some I'm going to say, educational imbalances which might generate uh, in cities, for instance, in our municip in our territories. And of those strategies uh, are can be summed up in two kind of uh, uh, of two kind of measure: monitoring, which are preventive, and compensatory, which are ex post. I mentioned some examples here from Milan, Oslo, and Barcelona which of course are great leader when it comes to inclusive educational policies and we whom we have worked a lot in, in our uh, organization. Here, uh, perhaps worth mentioning uh, when uh, a pertinent example of a school-based measure of, uh, is one offered by the city of Milan again, where uh, to adequately plan also compensatory policies, uh, it has, it, uh, the city has developed us a so-called, of course, is a translation, a criticality index to assess and monitor the specific risk, uh, of the specific segregation risk, and where uh, and where the index specifically reflects the share of foreign students against the share of the foreign resident, uh, considering the same age group, of course, in a given area. So that the city administration can monitor the the index, this index, and of the concentration and the potential of uh, uh, educational segregation, and intervene with the corrective policies. Another interesting example, and I promise to conclude in a, in a few moments. No worries, <laughs> no worries. Uh, again, uh, we have the city of Oslo. Additional resources, so compensatory ex post measure. 
which are meant to compensate financially those schools via uh, integrating specific socio-demographic allocation, uh, which are included in the total share of transfer going to school uh, and uh, uh, in a given city. And also this might include also specific pedagogical support for students with specific learning, special learning needs, which are of course extremely important to foster inclusive education outcome. And here I would like to mention again also measures the, when it comes to teacher attraction and retainment. This is another great challenge and challenge for social economic, uh, socioeconomically deprived schools, which uh, are the high levels of turnover in school staff. Here are social problems, low education, educational expectations, difficult related difficulties related to the career development, and also the lack of incentives to work in the private schools might also you know, lead to high teacher turnover and uh, decrease the quality of the educational outcome. So, uh, for instance, the city of Barcelona, but also other cities have uh, put in place specific incentives for teachers, professional development with career paths, and, uh, um, and also uh, including specific strategy to allocate and keep, uh, uh, allocate dedicated budget uh, 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 to keep trained and experienced teachers in vulnerable schools. Another interesting example relates, for instance, in countries with a high level of uh, local collective bargaining, where also cities are able to integrate uh, national collective agreements uh, for teachers uh, with uh, um, uh, providing, of course, salary incentives for teachers to attract and retain qualified staffs in low income areas. So also, that's also an important measure that local though that can vary across depending on the on the different industrial relations systems on the different competencies that municipalities have, but also providing salary incentives to teachers is a measure that uh, also uh, 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 has proved to be extremely effective in attracting qualified staffs in low income areas. And uh, I will perhaps conclude here with this broader picture on the instruments, the strategy, and I hand over the floor to some more concrete example. And of course, I'm extremely happy to reply to any question you might have here. Some uh, uh, you can see how, where to find us, and of course, uh, uh, really happy again to uh, to contribute to the discussion. And many thanks again for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Paolo, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it was a little bit beyond the time, but uh, since it was so interesting, uh, I didn't dare to interrupt because I was looking at the faces of, of some colleagues and it was uh, indeed very inspiring. I would actually ask you to place uh, some links uh, if uh, there is a page where you have some details about this, uh, these final examples that you gave. Uh, to place them in the chat or send us uh, by email uh, uh, later. And now we can uh, continue with the second uh, uh, presentation and more uh, practical, even though what Paolo presented is, is also very, very practical uh, in terms of examples. And we will have the, the example of, city, of the city of Helsinki. And the speakers are uh, Mario Kulonen, uh, who is a development uh, service director and uh, at the City of Helsinki Education Division, uh, which provides education services from early childhood education up to adult training. Mario has a long history and experience in the education sector, having led education services for more than 20 years. Relevant to highlight today is her involvement in the curriculum renewals and implementing the future school concept in Helsinki. She holds a PhD in education and is an enthusiast of development through education, doing voluntary work to promote children's education in developing countries. She will present together with her colleague Pia Pelimani, project manager also at the city of uh, Helsinki. Pia holds an, a master's degree in education and international development and has worked in the field of education in Finland and internationally for more than 10 years. In recent years, she has been specializing in enhancing cross-sector collaboration with different services and stakeholders to ensure every child gets the support they need. So, Mario and Pia, you have 20 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's our pleasure to, to be here and also to share our experiences. And let's just wait for a moment so we can start our presentation. So, most of our presentation, so I will give the floor to Pia. She has very practical practical uh, examples and, and things to, to share with you about how the municipalities can support or 
uh, support the implementation of inclusive education in practice. Very shortly, um, in Finland, uh, as was seen also in the draft, uh, Paolo show, so we, we are very decentralized uh, system and, and uh, our education services are run by the city and city council. We, we have a mayor and four deputy mayors, each one mayor for each division and and uh, and we got we get the funding from our city council and uh, and as said we run the the services from early high childhood education up to the adult training and the decision making the teachers uh, recruitment and uh, etc etc including budget as i said uh, the decision making they all are, is made at the local level, at city level, or even at the school level. We are providing services. Uh, or we are having almost almost like fourteen thousand five hundred uh, professionals working in our division, and majority of them are teachers. As said, there is early childhood education, basic education services, as well general upper and uh, education and vocational education and also Swedish services as we are a bilingual city. Thinking of segregation, so our main kind of focus here is that we want to ensure equal opportunities for each to learn and grow. Our objective is to be the most equitable and, and the best place to learn in, in the world. And we know that education uh, it targets the root causes of segregation uh, when we ensure equal opportunities for each learner. And we want to build an operation culture where we focus and emphasize the importance of collaboration, safe uh, neighborhood, sense of belonging. We are creating uh, learning communities where everyone can learn from each other and we want to build a city where everyone, for everyone, and a city that emphasizes non-discrimination and equality and equity. And at the same time, with this very collaborative and, and uh, approach, we want to uh, emphasize, we want everyone to, to feel that they are part of our inspiring uh, environment and everyone has the po po potential that everyone can grow to their potential and everyone's potential can flourish. We have five areas, we, we just launched our strategy for education 2030, that is uh, Helsinki Learn's future competencies. And in this strategy, uh, our focus is that we want to strengthen everyone's trust in the future and on the right hand side, you can see our three uh, object areas, our focus point, what we are working for. And today uh, we will hear more about the third one that what, how do we promote inclusive approaches? How do we pro promote inclusive education in uh, and simultaneous ensuring a sense of community, safety and well-being in everyday life? uh we we know that we need we need a, a promote a culture that supports well-being and because well-being it, it's a way of preventing problems and at the same time we need a systematic and timely actions to address various problems and now i will give the floor to pia so she can continue and give you an very practical uh, example how to implement all these objectives and and principles we have. Perfect. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Well, just shifting along here. Uh, hi from uh, me as well. Nice to meet you all online. Uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I'll just to share a few words uh, to create a bit of context. Uh, here you can see kind of our emphasis on the equity and e egalitarianism that has been very important in Finland for for many decades now. But at the same time. <clears throat> We're also coming to the like realization that uh, if we look at our neighborhoods and uh, look at our schools, we can see that you know there is the the gap is is widening, and segregation is definitely also a, a challenge that we are facing here. 
uh, and something that I'm sure that we could also learn from a lot from other cities who have been maybe facing this this challenge for longer and tried out different methods as well. Um, and maybe when we think of children, uh, we also know that uh, segregation actually affects them even more than our adult population. And it's not only in education, but also affects them in leisure time activities, even our healthcare services, and, and also the neighborhoods are getting more segregated. So it's again like it's a phenomena that kind of encompasses all of our services. And we, we really need to uh, work together to try to like turn this, make this into a more like a positive um, cycle rather than the negative cycle of the risk being uh, multiplied. And thinking of uh, inclusive education, we are keeping a very keen eye on here, for example, on the on the quality of, of education, making sure that we get, uh, you know, like uh, competent professionals in all of our all of our schools. And luckily, so far at least, there there isn't any sign of uh, personal segregation yet in Finland. Uh, but it, that is something to be very uh, kind of careful about. Uh, but yes, just to share like one uh, concrete example of how we've tried to do this cross-sector collaboration a bit better in Helsinki. We, I'm sure we all know that due to our organizations and the silos, it's not always so easy. Um, so I think we've come to the realization that our neighborhoods are facing different realities. So we also need to start finding local solutions for the local problems. Uh, and I will tell you about uh, work that we did together with the Bloomberg Philanthropies and Harvard University. Uh, so we decided to focus on one of these neighborhoods in Helsinki. <clears throat> well, we know it's, it's a diverse neighborhood. It has quite a low social economic index. Um, it's also the infrastructure is at the point where it needs a lot of maintenance, like new buildings are coming up. Um, there's some like safety concerns. There's a, a square that brings about a lot of uh, drinking, um, other social issues. So we decided to focus on this on this one neighborhood and see what we could do better uh, in collaboration with our different services. And so we applied for this program, we got in, we were 10, 10 cities around the world and all you had to do at first was to have the problem. And for us, the problem was the increasing like a sense of um, unsafety in the city for young people. And then the second thing we had to do was to uh, put together a cross sector uh, team. So we had people, eight people, uh, from education, social services, health services, uh, police department, uh, urban planning, and then culture and leisure. So we were basically encompassing all the all the city has to offer, and we really kind of thought that we if if we don't have the the keys uh, to this problem in our hands, then then who does? Um, and then I will like I will not talk you through all these processes. There's quite a lot of uh, material here, but. You can find out more about this uh, this methodology that was used. So this has been I cannot uh, hear Pia anymore. Pia, we can't hear you anymore. Pia, sorry. Yeah. Um, and the whole process really starts from, from the problem, making sure that we actually understand the problem uh, and understand like all the root causes uh, underneath it. Um, and then, then moving on, like once we have gotten to the bottom of the problem, it actually somehow becomes a shared problem. And then we can move on to the, onto the actions. Um, and I should also mention it was a highly participatory pro, uh, process. Uh, every week we, we were speaking to like do dozens of people, starting from the local kids and families, uh, our obviously key like core staff, uh, police, um, uh, researchers as well. Uh, but then we were really also trying to make sure that we were getting like ownership in the grassroots level, but then maintaining the authority. So we were even reporting all the way to the mayor throughout this pro process to make sure that things would actually then like carry on, that this wouldn't just be one of uh, intervention. And so we spent like quite many weeks uh, just focusing on this problem. And I have to say it was quite frustrating at times because we are obviously like a very or like organization that's always driving like solutions and we are expected to always have solutions in our head. But we, it just really made us focus on the problem for a few weeks. And here you can see, you don't really have to read this, but you can see how we mapped with this fishbone diagram this is basically encapsulating those weeks of discussions we had with probably over 100 people. So what were all the things that were behind uh, making young people feel unsafe? And you can see there are things like phenomena, like bullying, harassment there on the rise, 
But then we also found a lot of things like relating to our organization, like how maybe our services were not suitable or reaching everyone. And then, so somehow, like there was some magic in the, in this process. Once we had spent enough time uh, identifying the, the problem and all the root causes, then people on the table, so all of our different services, they started to really see their role also in the solutions. So they were like, maybe school said, hey, maybe we can do these things. And youth work said, okay, we can then focus on these things. And then actually, we once we got to the action point, uh, this happened maybe in the in the space of three, four months. In this neighborhood, we did about maybe these that you can see and, and some more interventions. So there were stuff we did uh, together with the schools, for example, to reach parents more, uh, especially those with migrant backgrounds, having very easy access uh, meetings with them, dialogues, using the local NGOs to like reach the people we often don't reach. Then we did a lot of cooperation with the police uh, to kind of strengthen uh, also the, the cooperation with them, thinking of the anti-bullying methods we have. Then also like one but one big challenge was for example like kids weren't like finding the the local leisure time activities so like focusing on that and then we also just brought in a lot of lot of good examples of for example how to tackle the substance abuse um, and then thinking of how to make the the physical environment for more, more child friendly just making quick fixes also in the neighborhood um how are we doing time okay yes so <laughs> i think maybe just to like summarize um, it really like paid off for us to like start with the, with the problem. Uh, like I said, it somehow maybe we started from quite a silos place, uh, and then but then we really started to, when the problem became uh, shared. Then we also like were quite quickly able to come up with uh, multiple uh, actions to do and multiple solutions. And that's what when we talk about systemic issues like like safety or segregation or mental health or substance abuse. We all know that you know you need multiple actions from different directions to have have any impact. Um, and then, kind of seeing what we managed to do there, like with the police statistics, we could see that in the neighborhood actually the number of crimes and antisocial behavior decreased. Uh, we definitely no no way think that we have solved the issue, but we know that we have learned a lot, like new, about the the phenomenon and how how to work better together. So now we can actually react a lot faster when anything comes up. And it was really important to have everybody at the table from the beginning uh, and make sure that people are heard or already quite early on in the in the process so that we don't bring these you know ideas from from like top to bottom but they were like early on very involved in the uh, in the process and here you can for example see a drawing by the local children showing like what they would like to see more in their neighborhood and these were actually then brought onto our like uh, as an information to our urban planning as well and the, and the work actually continues and this might seem like a lot of the things I mentioned are like kind of the, the small steps or like quite concrete quick actions. But we're actually seeing that we we have been like a lot of them are continuing and the, the cooperation continues in the area. And we have been able to kind of bring these like needs that have been um, sur surfaced there. We can bring these to the po political like decision makers and discussing on in how we can better like do kind of area based management as well. And then maybe if I could just end with this. Uh, Maria also shared like a beautiful uh, video about democracy that you had made with the was it with the universities. And I think like it's also like when we were having these discussions, it's often like just coming to the realization that it's not it's not even such a big groundbreaking thing that we need to do, but it's actually just facilitating also the the fact that people from different backgrounds would have those encounters and and see each other and make sure that we don't get a, divided divided city to to make sure that we foster this democracy that we value very highly. So I think that's everything from us, unless you have something to... No, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Pia. And just to conclude, or just to end that, this is our inclusive, just to emphasize that this is our inclusive approach, that we don't only have kind of lip service that everyone must be included. But if you don't feel that you are part of the community, the school community in the neighborhood. So actually the inclusive approach is not kind of realized. So, so we don't want just to have individual actions, but think the neighborhood as part of the inclusive education and how to bring uh, together all the actors and stakeholders 
to ensure that the neighborhood is, is safe and every every child and young one feels that they are part of their inspiring safe community and that's the way we can really enhance inclusiveness in our services and in our uh, citizens neighborhoods life but that's most important mm -hmm. thank you so much uh, mario and pia you recovered uh, some of the time that uh, <laughs> that we spend throughout the, the meeting. So thank you for being uh, so quick and, uh, and so complete uh, in, in your presentation. I also like the fact that I was getting some questions throughout your presentation, but then you were answering them also uh, in the next slides. So that's, that's really, really very, very uh, well uh, uh, put together and explanatory. So now I will uh, I will give the floor to Une Kaunaite, who is director of uh, Edu Vilnius, the Center for Education um, Improvement in Vilnius. Edu Vilnius is responsible for improving education quality in the capital of Lithuania through various initiatives. Previously, Une served as an advisor for education, science, culture and sports to the Prime Minister of Lithuania and she holds a master's degree in education from the University of Cambridge and she is also a writer with four published uh, novels. Une, you have 10 minutes, please. We can see the presentation, but I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Very good. Okay, so I'll start again by saying it was very enjoyable and I'm rethinking my presentation because there are so many other things that I could have said, but maybe it's a good thing that we all share different approaches. Um, so I'll start by just very, you know, quickly showing some numbers of Vilnius in order for you to compare the size of the city and, and what is, uh, um, you know, possible to do in, in, in the size of your cities. Um, so we have around 85,000 students. That's only general education, not counting kindergartens and about 7,500 teachers. And the number of, of students is growing. So that's one of the challenges that Vilnius is facing is that we are a, a growing city uh, as, as many others uh, uh, that is, you know, constantly um, challenged by, by that. Um, as an institution, we are agency of municipality. So we are part of the municipality, but we are also a little bit separate institution. And we are usually trying to say that we deal with everything, which is soft power. So we don't build schools. Um, we don't uh, work with, uh, let's say, um, uh, appliances to the schools. Um, this is mostly people inside the schools and different initiatives and, and programs of how to improve the quality of the schools. Um, and so, because we have 10 minutes, I'll just quickly uh, share some of the pillars, how we, we um, let's say, look into our programs. We have about 30 uh, at the moment inside the organization and share three examples that I thought are more of a broad inclusion. Um, and I think there will be some uh, overlaps with that, what Helsinki was, was talking about. So our programs, we usually talk about um, six areas. We do something with leadership. So everything with principals, vice principals, their training um, and, and how to help the school leadership to make the best decisions they can they can do. We also work a lot with teachers. And uh, as Paolo was mentioning, of course, we also work a lot with teacher shortage. Um, in area of inclusion, we work a lot with um, attracting new teachers. We, we fund studies for, for special education teachers and, and many other teachers. We, we work a lot with teacher training um in, in in inclusion area and, and all others uh we work with especially beginner teachers how to make sure that they stay inside the school so we have the mentorship program uh giving all the needs for for the beginning teachers then we have programs that are relating to specific subjects um and all of these programs usually involve part of teacher training and something extra new um 
Would it be like fab labs or STEM labs, or would it be, for example, gaming programs that we have in youth schools where we have uh, very difficult children who dropped out of other schools and we um, try to find engaging programs to get them back to the schools. Um, then we work with schools in transi transition, as we say, that is some transformation inside the school, um, for example, uh, uh, making schools more sustainable. Um, then we have all of this open Vilnius initiative that I'm going to talk more about and that I think very much relates to what Helsinki was, was talking about, and then also data and analysis. Um, that is something we, we very much want to uh, improve and, and have more always in the schools. And so one of the examples I'm going to use, which is sort of a little bit further away, but it's more of how we can give the tools to the schools. So uh, we developed this education monitoring system for the schools to, to use that would allow uh, schools to hear more about not achievements and, and the grades of the, of the students, but the voices of students, teachers and parents. And so it's basically a, a questionnaire made by researchers that every school can um, easily send out to, to their community and that it flows back in, in a very easily readable dashboard. We can see all of the results uh, of your school uh, and that basically relates to general satisfaction within the school, starting from like cafeteria, uh, homework, uh, how you get to school and you know finishing with bullying and and uh, how much you feel you belong inside the school how much you relate with with teachers and all of these questions so what we really try to do here is to give tools to the to the leaders of the of the school to start seeing where they have to work where they have to start working in their in their schools and there's no ranking, but they do see the averages of, let's say, if you're a gymnasium, you, you see how other gymnasiums, gymnasium schools on the average answer to specific questions. So you can see if, if there is a, you know, a specific problem inside your school. And it's not compulsory, um, even though we probably could do as municipality something compulsory. This is by choice. So at the moment, 83% of schools have joined the program, and we hope that uh, uh, in, an, in a few years time, we're going to have all of the schools that see the value in, in using more data inside their schools. A second example relates very much to the belonging that we heard, the, the word that uh, is, is very important, I feel, for inclusion. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you have uh, know the participatory budgeting idea uh, that where municipalities are giving money to um, citizens to decide um, for specific things inside the city. Um, and some schools are also trying that out, and we're really doing this on the scale in Vilnius. So at the moment, it's the second year in the, in the row that we're um, very much growing this initiative, and we have already 30% of the schools participating uh, and trying out participatory budgeting. So we, in the first year, we give extra money to the school, and we also give training and mentorship to make sure that it's really students who decide how what to do with with that extra money because of course adults are very keen to to first jump in with ideas so we really want to slowly grow this initiative in all of the um, areas in, in Vilnius and to make sure that students have voices inside the school and feel that they also make choices even with financing and we hear very very nice stories of of uh, how students love this initiative and all of the schools so far want to continue so we gradually decrease part of the money and, and ask for co-funding from the schools. And some principals just see the ideas of the kids and they're like, I'm going to fund all of them because we are very happy with, with what they're um, you know, suggesting to the schools. And the final, again, Bloomberg's name, I, I, I feel it's a, a theme here. <laughs> Um, but the final example that I could speak for for an hour just separately is is uh, our idea of Vilnius as a school that uh, we won Global Marriage Challenge uh, of Bloomberg Philanthropies um, in 2021, um, and the idea is basically of learning inside the city, and it's not a new idea at all. Uh, you know, we, we I think everywhere around the world we are talking about schools without borders, but we're really trying to push this um, as far as we can. So at the moment, we are talking about 10% of the time learning outside of the school borders. We're going to see how, how far we can go with this. Um, and we really try to give tools to the schools so that it will be easy 
and that it would be, first of all, related to the curriculum and that they would see that it's going outside and learning outside rather than just some fun activity um, that sometimes it's seen as. So what we're trying to do, we, we developed a platform that would be a very easy to use thing. Um, I think I'll just jump straight over how it looks like at the moment. It's been running for a year and uh, we already have 3,600 teachers who have joined the platform. Um, and uh, around 400 unique lessons. So basically it's either a lesson plan shared by another teacher of how you can uh, teach specific subject uh, in the curriculum outside, whether it would be a, a park or a street, or what is even more important for us is a specific organization or company that joined the program and is willing to teach students. And what we did on the platform, we made it very, very easy for the teachers to book a play. So basically any institution or, or organization that developed a, a lesson, we then make sure that the lesson is, is up to the curriculum and, uh, and relates to what's happening here. Um, and then they just put the slots and the teacher presses two buttons and can reserve a spot and come with the students. And we have from companies that let's say, teach how functions in 12th grade relates to AI, to police teaching, you know, safety inside the streets or, or uh, climate change, uh, waste companies showing through basketball how you can uh, recycle. And I think that very much relates what was said before about students belonging inside the city. We feel like when you grow up, knowing your city, knowing what's happening around, that's how you feel that you're a part of the city. And what I think is very much important with the uh, diversity and, and feeling a broader sense of inclusion is that what we hear is that students are very engaged in these lessons and those students who sometimes are you know, not involved in the classroom are the ones who get very much involved in these kind of lessons because they finally see the practice and value and, and it's a different kind of, of, of a lesson. I'll give one example that I very much love. This is a, a real lesson that happened al already a few times in Vilnius. It's ha actually happening in the real court with the real judge. And uh, what is judge is Hamlet. So this is literature lesson where Hamlet is being um, judged. And uh, we, after the lesson, we spoke to the students how much they liked it. And, and they said that one student said, I read Hamlet four times in order to be able to speak to speak in front of the judge because she was asking me very hard questions and the teacher said i've never seen my kids like that you know so involved and so passionate about the subject so these are you know a few types of the lessons that are happening inside the vilnius and uh, i'll finish by saying that we feel like the best way for us to work is by forming partnerships instead of saying you know as a municipality do this or do that we really want to show the value in various initiatives that we're doing and provide tools and empower schools to choose those initiatives themselves so we very much come with carrots rather than sticks and this is one of the ways how we are working in Vilnius. thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Une, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation and for keeping uh, with uh, with the time that uh, that we have. So now we uh, will go to to our uh, uh, fourth uh, and and last uh, uh, speaker of the day from uh, uh, Zagreb uh, uh, city. In this case, uh, Luca Juros is an education policy expert with almost two de de decades of experience and has led multiple higher education portfolios at the Croatian Ministry of, Ministry of Science and Education, including financing, inclusion and quality assurance. In 2015, he joined the European Commission, where he coordinated the recovery and resilience plans of Italy, Luxembourg and Lithuania uh, in the field of skills and employment. From uh, 2022, he is head of the Education, Sports and Youth Office of the City of Zagreb, which supervises 250 kindergartens and schools with over uh, 135,000 children and pupils. So, Luca, you also have 10 minutes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, is everything okay with the sound? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so I'm sharing the PowerPoint now. Please let me know if uh, there are any issues. Okay. It's coming up. Yes, we can see it. 
Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you for the wonderful presentation so far. Uh, I will be presenting the presentation today, but it was prepared together with my uh, colleague uh, Peter Hochmann, who is also in the call. Um, so, Zagreb um, has around 770,000 people, uh, 25, uh, 250 education institutions and just over 135,000 children pupils. Uh, the one thing that's relevant uh, from the point of view of Zagreb is that unlike uh, some of the other uh, cities and regions, Zagreb has a fairly homogeneous uh, pupil and children population, which means we are not facing uh, diverse uh, ethnicities uh, in certain parts of the city. When we do have foreign pupils and students, uh, they're usually distributed uh, in all parts of the city. So we don't specifically for specific challenges related to to parts of the city neighborhoods that 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 are that, that that face particular segregation challenges that doesn't mean that's not going to be the case in the future but right now uh it's not uh this is a feature well uh, perhaps also um an advantage uh, for for the city office for, for for the municipal administration that we don't face these kind of challenges just yet um, it, as a city, uh, we are both a city and a region. We are about 20% of the entire uh, uh, population of Croatia. Uh, and we are the founder of all the kindergartens and schools in the uh, city. Uh, however, we only have full responsibility for the kindergartens. That means that we employ 6,500 staff. We're in charge of their salaries. We set their salaries. Uh, we are in charge of all the investments and so on. As a city and a region, we are also primarily in charge of buildings, maintenance, operations. To the left are the pictures of uh, the recently built uh, education institutions and uh, schools in Zagreb. Um, in terms of the curriculum, school, school's curriculum, we are not in charge of uh, the curriculum itself, but we do have uh, autonomy in setting up innovative actions. And uh, in terms of inclusion, as the topic of today's webinar, Zagreb is doing reasonably well. So um, in 2022, if we take a look at the EU 2030 indicator of people at, at risk of poverty or social exclusion, Zagreb is doing better than uh, the EU member states, which as a capital, that's perhaps not surprising. But Zagreb is also uh, uh, among the top 15 in the EU uh, with the lowest rates of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion. So we, we are privileged with a fairly successful set of inclusion policies overall. Um, so what are we doing in practice? Uh, we, we, we try to both combine uh, horizontal measures that apply to the entire population as well as targeted measures. This is fully in line with the School Pathways Council recommendation. Uh, so, uh, in early childhood education and care, we invest both in quality and in inclusion. Uh, we have 28 construction projects to expand the coverage of early childhood education and care. We increase the salary and we are strongly subsidizing parental costs linked to the income of the parents. So, parents with lower incomes either pay lower costs or are fully uh, or, or have fully free early childhood education and care. Um, now, in terms of primary schools, ISCAD 1, so that's, uh, that's uh, the first four grades of primary school, Croatia as a country faces a challenge that we are uh, probably among the last EU member states which still have multiple shift primary schools. In Zagreb, uh, we have 70% of primary schools that are still in two shifts. Uh, so the way that Zagreb is, um, uh, and, and that's a result of unfortunate uh, cases of long-term underinvestment in school capacities. Uh, so what we are doing in parallel to expanding uh, school buildings, school capacity, we're investing in extended stay programs. That means that Zagreb is financing salaries of teachers that provide additional um, instruction time and additional care and additional activities for pupils in the first four grades of primary schools. Uh, we also set up as a kind of a combination of educational and social measure, we also set up a framework collaboration with UNICEF that targets both um, 
uh, groups uh, at risk of uh, poverty or social exclusion and children in general. But we also link our policies with the national policies. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the ministry passed a new policy on school meals, which, is, which before then there was no national policy on free school meals. And Zagreb is investing additional funds to ensure that every child uh, in the Zagreb school has access to free school meals. Uh, also for pupils with special educational needs, uh, we are uh, financing additional teaching assistance so that every child that has a need for teaching assistance, uh, about 40% of those teaching assistants are funded by the ESF Plus, uh, so coordinated by the ministry, and the additional 60% is financed fully uh, by the city of Zagreb. We also aim actions that target actions at underrepresented groups. So, uh, again, we supplement the national action that provides free textbooks uh, to primary school pupils. We expanded that to all, uh, so educational materials to all primary and secondary school pupils. Uh, we also develop city scholarships for uh, secondary school pupils targeting underrepresented groups or groups at risk, including Roma pupils with disabilities or pupils from lower income families. We also set up separate um, uh, city agencies, and this is the innovation aspect, the, the aspect where the city can provide additional services for youth health and for community support, which is now expanding um, actions uh, to fight against uh, peer violence. And we're also providing further kinds of uh, support. This is specifically for leisure activities. So that means the pupils for underrepresented backgrounds that they don't get excluded from uh, from uh, excursions to the coast or some other kinds of extracurricular activities to which otherwise they, they perhaps may not have access. And the major reform that we launched at the end of 2023 is an action plan on inclusion for pupils with special education needs. In Croatia as a whole, and in Zagreb in particular as well, we have problems with capacities for pupils with special education needs. And the institutions that do provide uh, that kind of support, both schools and health institutions and social services, simply do not have sufficient capacities. and in oftentimes cooperation is fragmented, depends on personal initiatives. So we brought together all the stakeholders, all of these institutions, parents, experts, researchers, and we developed uh, a comprehensive action plan together with, with consultation with the ministry and the National Agency for Education, uh, with actions that broadly follow, again, the council recommendation uh, approach. So we, we do target support to leadership staff and parents. We want to make sure that those transitions that are, which we see are the most difficult for pupils and for parents from early childhood education care to primary school, then from primary to secondary school, we want to make those pathways easier. We want to expand mobile teams, which means that in addition to the teams that support special education needs pupils in schools, we want to provide teams that expand that capacity through mobile activities. Uh, strengthen intersectoral cooperation, and of course, invest in infrastructure in access, uh, to ensure accessibility. And just in terms of the point of view of this working group and uh, the takeaways that you may want to go home with, um, the, the challenge that we see is that the capacities at school level are oftentimes insufficient. Um, uh, sometimes simply there is not, not enough pedagogists or psychologists in schools, but uh, oftentimes there are so many things going on in schools, um, particularly challenging circumstances, um, perhaps, uh, or, or simply insufficient experience of the principal. Um, and we found that if that, that one thing we, we need to strengthen is the support to the principals. And that's something we would strongly encourage also um, to, to be the ministry level measures in the member states as well as 
uh, the EU level measures. The support to school leadership can really ensure that all of these big goals are met at the school level. And then also when we don't have sufficient capacities and with demographic shifts and the fall in the number of pupils that Zagreb is facing just as Croatia and the rest of the EU, uh, perhaps uh, we need enough innovative models to share effort. And that's something that we're trying to do in Zagreb with the mobile teams. Also in Zagreb we and in Croatia, we are facing a challenge in the trust in the education system. We see a high level of criticism coming from the parents and uh, we don't exactly have an answer to that question just yet. And that's something perhaps that uh, that uh, would be interesting to pursue in further. We, the recommendation, the council recommendation does say stronger involvement of the parents, but uh, this, this question of trust is an open issue. But not just to talk about the challenges, we do have many relevant positive lessons learned. We see in Zagreb that um, our impact is greatly strengthened when we can build on national measures. I mentioned those textbooks, meals, teaching assistance, but that means that if we can put to work the resources of the city of Zagreb uh, to supplement and expand the national measures, that means that we can have that can multiply their impact. From the point of view of ministries, that means that with, if you're in, and the commission, if you're building, designing ESF calls, Erasmus calls, try to build in a small hook that would allow uh, the regional authorities, the municipal authorities to expand the existing measures. So it's just to provide those innovative extra efforts uh, that can target the specific needs of a municipality, just to put a hook that they can work on to build on those measures that you are developing on the national or EU level. Also, we want to identify and target gaps. When we see that something is not being addressed, uh, the cities can do a lot to, to actually target those goals in their specific context. And so in, we, with those agencies I mentioned, those institutions for youth health and preventing peer violence, that's what we are doing in Zagreb. And we see uh, an uh, added value in that. And in, simply in terms of uh, a municipal authorities, a tip that I can give is try to plan partnerships from the start, be that ministry, stakeholders, schools. The point is that not only with those partnerships help with the design of stronger policies from, from the start, but also down the line, when those policies get rolled out, partnerships can make sure that, that you have the impact, but also that you don't see stakeholders rising up and saying they were never consulted, this doesn't address the real problem, and so on. And finally, the thing we learned and we are seeing time and again, want to invest in data and analysis, including data visualization. Uh, in Zagreb, we, we have developed we are using Power BI, but also any other service can be. So all of those data that, that, that the administration routinely collects, investing and putting in that extra effort to, to, to visualize the data, to uh, see, uh, to spot the patterns, uh, make sure that we do know what we need to target. And uh, that's it. Thank you again very much for a chance to, to talk to you. Uh, we'd be happy to address any questions and to stay in touch in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Luca, for this very interesting uh, presentation as well. And I actually at the stage that uh, after the, these four presentations, I really feel that I need to congratulate all the speakers for crafting so well their presentations and highlighting exactly what uh, what were the objectives of uh, of this seminar. And uh, we had uh, meetings with um, with some of you before and with others we articulated in in writing. And I'm very happy to see that uh, um, we we were able to uh, to understand each other and you, you really delivered uh, exactly what uh, what we needed and even uh, beyond. Um, and now let's take a few moments for for questions, uh, taking advantage of the fact that uh, speakers uh, are here with us. And uh, I saw that uh, there were a few comments uh, in the chat that all of you were able to read from Borboli, some additional insights into these uh, issues being presented, and then a conversation uh, from from Lilia regarding this international educating cities movement or program, and uh, I saw that Mario already replied to it. But uh, perhaps Lilia, you want to uh, to take one minute or a few seconds to explain a little bit more about this movement and how does it relate with uh, with today's uh, uh, seminar? It was made, uh, and. Uh... Congratulations to, to all of the speakers for the 
uh, interesting, relevant, and clear uh, presentations. Um, well, my question is uh, was in fact due to the fact that in Portugal we, as I wrote in the chat, have um, 94 uh, cities that joined the movement of dedicating cities. And uh, as a whole, what is aimed with that movement is, uh, is that all the, the pupils and students of those cities have uh, access to, to an education that uh, somehow um, makes from them or trains them to be inclusive citizens as well. So uh, uh, active and and uh, and inclusive citizens in the, in those uh, societies and in those communities, let's say, or municipalities, because usually are the municipalities that apply to this. <coughs> I'm sorry to this movement. Um, that's why I was, you know, just asking because um, I was related with a municipality that, in fact, is one of those that joined the movement. And uh, when I heard our colleagues uh, introducing um, their projects and, and uh, the, 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 what they've been doing in their cities, uh, it reminded me that uh, it had uh, several points in common, that's why. Uh, but I have just one question, not exactly one question, but uh, something that uh, it's not the first time that I ask for those of you who know me from, from, <laughs> from the working group. But, um, uh, when you talk about special needs students, uh, usually um, the idea is that uh, that we're referring to the ones that somehow um, have less uh, have some problems that uh, uh, either because they have uh, some problems with mobility or cognitive problems or any kind of problems, but no one refers or has referred to gifted students. Uh, would any of your uh, uh, movements, uh, projects, uh, um, uh, have in mind uh, what to do with the, uh, uh, the, 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 what approach to use with gifted students? Because they are also part of, of the system and sometimes they become also a problem, let's say, I mean, they have to be addressed also. Uh, uh, and inclusion is, is, is exactly that. You have to give the same opportunities to anyone so that they can achieve the most they can. It's just that. Thank you very much. I always have a question, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lilia. And I see Mario already has a reaction uh, to your uh, questions. Mario, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Lillian, and I think that was a brilliant question. And actually, if uh, you list, if you can remember, go, go back to this, what I said that when we were talking or working on that topic of future education 2030. So one of our kind of focus point in our operational culture is that we need to uh, operate in a way that it uh, enables everyone's potential to flourish and grow. And that's exactly uh, an inclusive approach that not only Finland, we have been very good in supporting those that have problems or challenges in learning, but we have not been that good in promoting the talents. And But that's something that we really want to address. And there's not time to go in more detail, but I think that would be something to share also uh, within this network that what could what are the tools that you can do without kind of threatening the equality and equity uh, our objectives on that so very much uh, agreed what uh, what you said about this uh, the, this challenge and how to address it uh, keeping in mind that we need to have everyone everyone included in terms of building better and sustainable future and success for future, not only for ourselves, but for our societies and the whole planet. Thank you so much, Mario. I think that's a very good uh, thread, uh, even for our uh, working group uh, to follow upon, because these uh, different groups and and particularly the the group of gifted students keeps uh, coming back to us. 
uh, and indeed uh, we would benefit for uh, for exploring more and uh, getting to know more practices and, and measures in this area. Uh, I see there are no other hands uh, uh, raised at the moment. Uh, we can still take a few minutes uh, in case uh, other colleagues have questions. I invite you to, to raise your hands or if you do not find the option to voice uh, your interest uh, in asking a question or if you feel more comfortable to put it in the chat. And if not, then we will have uh, anyway an, an exercise, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, where we will have the opportunity to, to think a little bit further about uh, the input that we received, a lot of input in, in such a short time, and then more questions will arise uh, from there. So I continue without seeing any hands. I think we we are safe to proceed uh, to to the second part. So here we would like to invite uh, the the working group uh, members for the uh, an exercise, and of course uh, our speakers. If you are available for another ten minutes, it would be great to to count uh, with you on this. And uh, we will have uh, a jamboard. Uh, um, a tool that uh, you can uh, already open. It's uh, in the chat, the link. Um, and I will ask uh, my colleague uh, Stephanie to share her screen and explain very, very quickly how it will work. <laughs> 